Good morning, my brothers and sisters. God bless you. I hope you are weathering the coronavirus quarantine in um, overcoming fashion. Um, I'm going to ask the question this morning. Does the Bible teach the appearance of a third temple? Now, this is an important subject matter that we want to discuss today about the third temple. Obviously speaking, there are many people even in the realm of Christianity that don't believe there's going to be a third temple that is rebuilt. Also, they don't believe, uh, many people don't believe that there's going to be a temple at all, especially from the Islamic faith, that there won't be another temple built on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. But obviously, this is a very important uh, understanding to have because in the end times, we see that the temple is going to play a very important role and a very important function in the um, end time scenarios, especially as it relates to the Antichrist and the return of the Messiah. So this morning, I want to just briefly go over a little temple history and try to answer this question. What does the Bible teach relative to the appearance of a third temple, let alone the rebuilding of one? So let's start off with the first temple. Well, you all know that the first temple of God was uh, in Jerusalem, obviously built in Jerusalem. It was patterned after the tabernacle in the wilderness. So we know that when God instituted the tabernacle in the wilderness and had the Holy of Holies in his presence, would, would travel with the people of God, um, we know that King Solomon was commissioned um, by the Lord through his father, King David, to complete and, and rebuild or build the uh, temple of God. And we find that in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1 through 38. There's a beautiful story about the completion of that temple. And that was about a thousand years, actually 950 years before Jesus was even on the earth, that this first temple was constructed. And that place where it was constructed is the place where the second temple was constructed as well. So it survived over 360 years. And then after 360 years that that temple, after Solomon built the temple, the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar, if you remember the story in 2 Kings uh, chapter 25, in the year 586 BC, this is before Jesus, of course, he came in and completely destroyed the temple, took all the temple artifacts, removed everything, took the Jews into captivity. And that's when you read about the, when you hear the term Babylonian captivity, that's where it started, at the destruction of the temple in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. And one of the things I want to tell you about the, that first temple that Solomon built, Solomon built a temple that was stunningly beautiful. It was a, a work of art, and you can read about that, of course, in Second Kings. But the, but the reality was is that every single element, every single workman that was utilized was um, a, a gifted individual and the top of their field. And the Lord commissioned all of them through Solomon to rebuild this stunningly beautiful temple. Now, 48 years later... The Persians, after this temple was destroyed, the second temple, um, uh, or the first temple was, de was destroyed by the Babylonians, 48 years later, the Persians permitted the Jews to return from the Babylonian exile. And you remember that story, it was about 538 BC, under King Cyrus and Darius, that uh, in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, in your Bible, you can study that, the Jews began to rebuild the walls of the city and the temple itself. And it was completed, it took about 15 years for that temple in the times of Ezra and Nehemiah to be rebuilt. But the problem was it wasn't the same. It was not as grand, it was not as beautiful as the Temple of Solomon. So it was kind of like almost a second-rate type of, of temple, but it did get rebuilt. Yeah, the intense 
spiritual nature of the second temple couldn't couldn't or the, the intense nature of the first temple couldn't even be compared with the second temple uh, the second temple didn't have the constant open miracles that the first temple had it was really somewhat of a uh, a lesser structure in spiritual and physical ways as well um, prophecy will also disappear during the early years of the second temple that's one of the marks of the second temple when when god was speaking to his people he prophesied all throughout its history and then in the probably the last 500 years uh, prophecy stopped and this was during the years of the second temple now you will note notice that in the second temple that the ark of the covenant that was in the first temple is gone now it's not in the second temple of Ezra and Nehemiah. And although there is a holy of holies, it's empty. It's standing empty. And the special gold lined cedar chest, which had contained the, the, um, the tablets of the Ten Commandments and the manna and Aaron's rod, is all gone. Now, what happened to it? From the first temple, we know all that stuff was in there. It was very powerful. Miracles were happening all the time. By the time the second temple was built, the Holy of Holies is empty. Aaron's rod that budded is gone. So what happened in the interim? Well, the Talmud, which is sort of a commentary on the Torah, which is the Old Testament, the Old Testament law, uh, really relates two different opinions on it. Number one, the first opinion says that the Babylonians took everything into captivity. And once the Babylonians took the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, all that, uh, Aaron's rod, they took, they completely demolished the temple area. When they took that back into to Babylon, it was completely disappeared for, don't know if they destroyed it or they buried it or what happened to it. And the, uh, the second um, um, opinion that the, the Talmud offers is that it was hidden by King Josiah, who had anticipated um, the invasion of, of Babylon, Babylon, the Babylonians, and, and the destruction of the temple. And he took it and hid it somewhere. Now, there are documentaries. You can go on Google. You can see that uh, in Ethiopia, there's a place where they think the, the Ark of the Covenant is, and it's... Um, kind of protected by these um, Ethiopian Jewish priests who won't let anybody in there. And the stories go on and on and on. But needless to say, from the point of the Babylonian captivity all the way through, no matter what the temples were, the Ark of the Covenant and uh, the, the, the Holy of Holies was, was a place where it was desolated. The Ark of the Covenant was gone. <clears throat> it was in this temple, in this uh, this second temple, that the uh, if you remember the story, that King Antiochus, the Syrian king Antiochus Epiphanes, he desecrated the temple. And about 168 years prior to Jesus being born, um, Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a literally a, a, a son. Uh, or general uh, of uh, the great Alexander the Great, he literally destroyed and desecrated the temple. And you all know the story of Hanukkah, and that's how that story came to be. They went in after this temple was kind of restored and rebuilt in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Well, this is the temple that they went in and desecrated. And that triggered the revolt of the Maccabees, of course, and then you have the whole entire story of the miraculous intervention of how the Maccabees uh, overcame Antiochus Epiphanes and literally restored or refurbished the temple area, rebuilt the temple area in the way that um, they instituted, once again, the light that was in the Holy of Holies. And um, it, was, it was a miracle that the, the, the oil that they, they found was really good enough for one day. They needed it to be good enough for eight days because that's how long it took to consecrate oil uh, to restart that eternal light that was in the Holy of Holies. But lo and behold, every single day that they came back, that one day of oil burned and burned and burned. 
And they say a great miracle has happened here. And thus we have the story of the restoration of the temple in about 168 BC. This temple was largely destroyed. And this is after the fact. This is fast forwarding now to after Jesus was born. And now let's look at the year about approximately 63 BC. Um, this is prior to Jesus being born, correct that. Uh, this temple was largely destroyed by the Romans, the conquering Romans, when they came into Jerusalem. This is under Pompey, when Pompey was leading the Roman armies in 63 BC. They partially destroyed the temple during that period of time. And it survived, um, so mathematically speaking, it survived the temple about 450 years from the time uh, that it was, it was um, uh, first built. The Herodian temple, now we talk about King Herod's temple. This is the second temple now, but it's, this is now it's refurbished. After Pompeii in 63 BC came in, kind of messed things up in there, and Herod started to rebuild the earlier temple. He was called Herod the Great, and it's called the Herodian Temple. Matter of fact, I'm sitting or standing in the courtyard of the Temple of Herod back behind me on the screen, you can see. Well, this is the temple that was erected, and this is a very good uh, replica of what it was like when Jesus was walking the earth. This is what Herod did. He actually rebuilt and made it. He actually took more acreage on the Temple Mount, the, the Zion Escarpment. He actually increased the size of the temple area, and he rebuilt the temple and made it much more grander than the um, Ezra Nehemiah uh, Temple, which is you can see from behind me here that it was a beautiful, beautiful temple. Um, and Jesus and his disciples walked these porticos and these courtyards many, many times during the time of his ministry. It was a magnificent, magnificent structure that existed in the time of Jesus. This temple was uh, completely destroyed, however, as Jesus prophesied by the Roman legions in 70 AD under Titus, when Titus came in. There was an uprising in Jerusalem. They came to, to quash the uprising. And in uh, 70 AD, which is approximately 40 years uh, after Jesus, 37 years or so, after Jesus had literally prophesied that this temple would be torn down. He said to the, his disciples, not one stone is going to be left upon another. And, you know, here's the reality of the situation when they destroyed the, the temple under Pompeii, they were so agitated and angered against the Jews of that time that literally, in the temple itself, all of the stones were torn down. Not one stone was left upon another. Now, we do have some remnants of the gates of the city. Of course, the western wall is still there. Um, the walls that surround the city. But the temple is exactly what Jesus said. Not one stone would be left upon another. And it's interesting to me that since that time, there has not been a temple on that escarpment, on that, that, um, uh, that temple mount for all of these years, all the way up until the event that happened in June 7th of 1967, the Six-Day War, the Israeli Brigadier Commander Colonel Mata Gur, G-U-R, captured the Temple Mount. And after the capture, there's a uh, little video of that. You can probably Google it. He's sitting and he was announcing, jumping up and down, the Temple Mount is back in our hands. The Temple Mount is in our hands. In 1967... That's not that far ago, nor long ago. In 1967, Israel finally recaptured 
the Temple Mount. You say, well, why is that important? Well, obviously, if you believe what the Bible says, that it is necessary for Israel to be in possession of the Temple Mount, to build a temple, to rebuild a temple on that mount, so that the sacrifices can be restarted, and then the end time scenario can unfold. But if you're in the other camp, it's not important at all. It doesn't matter if, the, if Israel had the Temple Mount or doesn't have it, because the, the, the Dome of the Rock and the Mosque of Omar is right in that courtyard over there on um, my right-hand side, your left-hand side. The Temple is uh, uh, area which would be highly contested by the, uh, the nation of Islam and the religion of Islam would contest the fact that there will be a temple built there. As a matter of fact, they say no temple will ever be built on this mountain. But you know, you ask the average Christian, what do you think about the third temple? Because we know the second temples, the first temple and the second temple already, we explained. What about the third temple? Most Christians couldn't answer you any questions about that. And a lot of Orthodox Jews will tell you, no, there's going to be a third temple and the sacrifices will start and the ashes of the red heifer will be utilized in all the temple articles and the articles in the Kodesh HaKodeshim and the holy place will all be reinstituted. This is what God wants and God, God wills. And uh, interestingly enough, if you want to Google this, I saw this the other day, I was amazed at that. The Temple Institute, which is a, a group of uh, individuals who study this particular aspect of, of Christianity and Judaism, they actually have raised two red heifers that are perfect red heifers. Now, they have been tried to raise them. Even when I was uh, coming up in the Lord, I know that in, out in Texas they were trying to raise them. They couldn't do it. They were spotted, they were blemished, they had different color hairs and mixed in with the red. Well, now there are two pure red heifers in existence, which is necessary because the ashes of a red heifer need to be mixed into the sacrifices of, or utilized in the sacrifices of the, um, of the Holy Temple and the Temple service. So you see, Things are happening at a very, very rapid pace. Now, I understand that many people don't believe that there, the, there's going to be a third temple. I'm going to try to prove to you biblically that there is. Because most people, especially in Christianity, and especially what we would call replacement theology Christians, who believe that there is that God has done with Israel, he's done with all the, the Jewish things of that nature. They say that the third temple is us. We are the third temple. Now in 1 Corinthians 13, I think we have a, a graphic on that for you to go to follow along with. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16 and 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 say this, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you or do you not know that your body is the temple of the holy spirit who is in you whom you have from god and that you are not your own so your body spiritually and physically as well is can be said to be the temple of the lord and or the the place where the lord dwells now he doesn't dwell in in buildings According to the Pauline the theology, he deals in uh, or lives or abides in human beings, and you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I, and I understand that from a very spiritual point of view. However, Orthodox Judaism, which we have to uh, pay some attention to, believes that in the rebuilding of the temple, of a third temple, and the resumption of the korban, which is the sacrificial worship, is mandatory in the Messianic age. And there is a lot of biblical support 
for that idea and for that belief. Although many Christians surprisingly hold that the temple is not even necessary uh, or even will be built. So what does the scripture say about this conundrum, this, this difference of opinion? And what does it say about the Jewish temple being rebuilt before the coming of the Lord? So let's start with Isaiah, the second chapter, and the second verse, and the third verse. He may, Isaiah makes a statement about a time in the future as he's prophesying. He says, many people will come up and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. Now, you could, could interpret that as the second temple, but that temple was destroyed. And he's also, in the same context in Isaiah, prophesying about the end of the age, not only the first coming of the Messiah. That's important to know. Amos chapter 9, verse 11 says, In that day I will restore David's fallen shelter. David's fallen shelter obviously is a biblical reference to the temple. I will repair its broken walls. I will restore its ruins, and I will rebuild it as it used to be. Amos also prophesying about the end of times. But if that wasn't enough, let's look at two real strong prophets, one in the Old Testament, one in the New. The first one in the Old Testament is the prophet Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 is so critical and so important to Christian theology, can't be underestimated. Daniel 9, 27 says, He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple... He will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. And many of you know, especially those of you who study eschatology, which is the study of the end times, you know that the abomination of desolation must take place in the revelation or the revealing of the Antichrist. In this key prophecy... In Daniel 9, God says that in the middle of the, of the last seven years, an event that is called the abomination of desolation will be set up on the wing of the temple. This prophecy is in reference to a future seven-year period, which Daniel goes on to call the 70th seven, or the last times or the last days. Therefore, by the middle of this last seven years, a Jewish temple will exist, it has to exist, on the Temple Mount in order for the Antichrist to cut off these sacrifices in the temple. The temple has to be there. Well, obviously, the Antichrist hasn't done that yet, and the end is not here yet. So a temple must arise from somewhere and Jesus both Jesus and the Apostle Paul confirmed this when they were referring to the event known as the abomination of desolation in their prophecies about the second coming so let's look at the New Testament prophet called Jesus Jesus is not only a priest a high priest not only Messiah not only the Son of God he's also a prophet and he prophesied many things in the Bible, especially in Matthew chapter 24, about the last days. So let's look and see what he says about the last days. Matthew 24, verse 15. Jesus speaking. So when you see in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel... Let the reader understand. And then in Mark 13, 14, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, 
let the reader understand. So what he's saying, he says, listen, he says, there's going to, something's going to happen. He's referring to Daniel's prophecy about the Antichrist cutting off the sacrifice in the middle of this one week or this one set of sevens, which is really seven years. So three and a half years after this temple is built, the Antichrist is going to cut off, he's going to stop all the activities that were so joyfully received in the rebuilding of the temple, finally on the Temple Mount. And Jesus said, let, in both places, let the reader understand. What that means is that you need spiritual discernment. Those of you who are reading this, you have to understand what he's saying, not in an intellectual way only, but in a spiritual, revelatory way. You need the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will tell you what Jesus is saying is this is going to happen. Now someday, an antichrist is going to be on the earth. He's going to go into the temple, desecrate the temple, and be an abomination. And he, that will make things desolate. So what would be the big abomination to the Jewish people? And to all people, really, but mostly to the Jews. When anybody would go into the Holy of Holies, the Kodesh HaKodeshim, walk into the Holy of Holies and replace the spirit of the living God with their own image. So the image of the beast will be an abomination in the holy place. It's not supposed to be there. Jesus says, standing where he does not belong. And that's what the Antichrist is going to do. In these two verses that we just, we just spoke of, Matthew 24, Mark 13, in these two verses, Jesus refers to this abomination that causes desolation, which the prophet Daniel said would take place in relation to the temple. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul describes the abomination that causes desolation in the context of the last days, when he says the Antichrist will go into the Jewish temple and proclaim himself to be God. That's really the goal of the Antichrist. So let's read something very important because I think a lot of people would say, would say about Old Testament scripture, well, you know, that doesn't matter what Daniel says. He was Jewish and God's done with the Jews and done with Israel. Well, what about the Apostle Paul? What about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 12? Let's look at that together. That is very important. It's on the screen. It might be a little small to read, but I'll read it out loud with you. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering unto him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure, or be disturbed by either a spirit or a message, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in this way, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. So the day of the Lord, when the Lord returns to the earth, will not come until the ap apostasy happens. That's the first thing he says. What is the apostasy? The Greek word apostasis literally means falling away. And what does that mean to you and me? If you are a Christian, that means you were once following Jesus and now you're not following him anymore. Or the church at large following Jesus, repenting, walking in a lifestyle of righteousness and holiness, now no longer doing that and walking in the way of secular humanism. Apostasis means to fall away from the faith, or go back to the world, even. Paul says, before the Lord returns to the earth, there's going to be a falling away. No, nope, let me correct myself. He says, a great falling away. That's numerically large. And I would say to you, watching my television set, and seeing how our government treats the Bible, 
how it treats the Ten Commandments, how it treats Christianity, how people are walking away from the Lord left and right. Church attendance is going down, down, down. People are getting more and more skeptical, cynical. Well, they're walking away from the faith. But the Lord said, don't be surprised by this. Before I return, there's going to be a great apostasy, a great falling away before this happens. So back to chapter 2, verse 3. Let no one deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness be revealed. The son of perdition or destruction is probably a better word there. Who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. Well, we're seeing God replaced by many things in this generation. So, he takes up his seat. Where? Where does he take up his seat ultimately, this son of perdition, this one who replaces God with himself? In the temple of God. I underlined it for you so that you will see it. I don't know why people cannot see that. But many people just don't want to believe that, that this can happen, and don't want to give Israel the leeway and latitude to take the ground back that is necessary to rebuild the temple. But the Antichrist, at some point in time, is going to sit down in the temple and establish himself in the temple as one who is greater than God and then Paul goes on to say, if you look at the scripture once again, verse 4, displaying himself as being God. Verse 5, do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, this man of lawlessness, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. I don't have to repeat that to those of you who are seeing what's going on in our nation. Lawlessness is abounding. It's already at work. Only he, watch this, only he who restrains him, or he who now restrains, will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then, but that lawless one, lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end the appearance of his coming. That's the Lord's coming. He's going to bring all that to an end after he does this incredible work of uncovering the Antichrist. One of the things I want to point out to you here he says the mystery of lawlessness obviously is working. It's working right now. It's working in our streets. Look at New York. Look at what's going on in, in, in Philadelphia and Chicago, all over the Los Angeles. Lawlessness is abounding. They're beating cops over the head with sticks. They're just ignoring uh, authority. Lawlessness is, is the, the word of the day, really. And he says this lawlessness is at work. But there's something restraining it from really exploding onto the scene. Yeah. And there's something restraining the Antichrist and the false prophet from coming on the scene too. It can only be two things. And I want you to think about this. A lot of people think, well, it's an angel of the Lord. Because it's proof, positive, that the angels of the Lord have the ability to, to hold things and release things. That's key to the book of Revelation, obviously, as well. However, there's another way to look at this. The power of the Holy Spirit inside the true church, that's you, who are born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. How many of you know the Holy Spirit has the power to hold back the spirit of Antichrist? It's greater than the spirit of Antichrist. But he says, when that is removed, then this lawless individual and this power of lawlessness will be just uncorked 
on the world. Well, what does it mean to be removed? Well, there's a lot of people, and I'm kind of lean this way myself, that believe that the Holy Spirit is the one. It's not an angel holding back the Antichrist. I think it's the Holy Spirit that's holding him back. And when he is removed from the earth, then the spirit of lawlessness will increase exponentially. What would be the removal of the Holy Spirit from the earth? Where does the Holy Spirit dwell now as the pledge and the down payment for our salvation? Well, God says, I've given you the Holy Spirit. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit, dwells in you. Well, if the Holy Spirit is dwelling within the context of the church, and the church is somehow removed from the earth, then there will be no longer a power of the Holy Spirit to restrain. Now, I know that's a controversial because the, the Holy Spirit is just as omniscient and just as omnipotent and just as omnipresent as God is and as Jesus is. But I think there's a certain aspect of the Holy Spirit that obeys the counsel and the disclosure of Jesus and the Father in heaven. And I think that aspect means that there would be a rapture of the church and after the rapture of the church, I think it's going to be different on the earth. I don't think it's going to be the same. I think what you're going to see, things not getting better, but things getting exponentially worse. And then the man of lawlessness will have his way with the nation of Israel. So, in verse 8, or let's go to verse 9, because we already said about Jesus' is coming. That is the one who is coming in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all deception of wickedness for those who, have, who will perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. So for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they may all be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in falseness or wickedness is probably the better word there, Paneris. So he says, God will send a deluding influence on the earth during the last days so people will believe what is false. I have never seen a time in my short 72 years on the earth when people are more deluded and believing what is false than now, especially in the year 2020. I think the spirit of delusion is running rampant. But obviously, it is going to get worse and worse and worse. So we know that the Antichrist, once again, is going to sit in the Holy of Holies, in the temple of God. I'm going to repeat that, in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. That's important to know. That means that Israel or the Jews are going to rebuild a temple. It's going to be the third temple, the true third temple. Not the physical or the spiritual temple that we are, but a physical temple that's going to be rebuilt. This raises the question, to me at least, as to precisely when will this temple be rebuilt? In the Bible, if you research, it doesn't really reveal the actual um, answer to that question. All it says for certain is that the temple will be in existence when the Antichrist reveals himself, in verse 3 and 4 we just read, and that we will be in the middle of the tribulation period, or it will be in the middle of the tribulation period, according to Daniel 9.27. Since this will, be the, will only be three and a half years into the tribulation, many scholars have concluded that the temple will likely be rebuilt before the tribulation begins. Because logically, how could a magnificent building such as the last third temple be 
How could that be constructed in such a short period of time if it was cut off at the end of only three and a half years? It doesn't make sense. But let me tell you what I think. This is, this is uh, for no extra charge. This is what I think. The real issue is, for those of you who have been studying this along uh, with us, even through the years I've been teaching on this, Mecca, Mecca, one of the high holy places of Islam, is going to be destroyed. How do we know that? Well, both in the Bible and in the Quran and the Hadith, it, pre it predicts it. The Hadith, the Hadith is a commentary on the works of Muhammad. Okay, so this is a commentary. Same way the Talmud and the Mishnah is a commentary on the Torah. Well, they have a Hadith for the Quran. And the Hadith says that before Kimaya, the Kaaba, which is Mecca, will be destroyed by an army led by black men from Ethiopia. This is what is in the Hadith for the Quran. Led by a black man from Ethiopia, never to be built, never to be rebuilt again, and that will signal the final showdown. They seek then to make Jerusalem their holy city because Mecca is destroyed. Now, Mecca is destroyed according to their prophecies, according to their prophets. It's their high holy place. But Jerusalem's also uh, a high holy place for them as well. So when Mecca is destroyed as the chief place, then we find they're going to turn their sights on Jerusalem. So could Mecca possibly be the mystery Babylon? The great city whose destruction will come in one hour, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 18, verses 2 through 19. Could Mecca be that city that is destroyed in one hour? And then all attention is turned then to the Temple Mount. And there's going to be a big fight over that Temple Mount. And somebody's going to come out on top. And they're going to rebuild their holy place there. It will either be the Jews or the Muslims. Now, if you study a student of the Bible, you believe that there will be a temple rebuilt. If you don't believe that, you believe that things are going to stay the same and that somehow, some way, Islam is going to wrestle back the Temple Mount and take it away from Israel and keep that now as their high holy place. The Mosque of Omar and the Dome of the Rock being the central points of that. That's a very important question to answer. My belief is, and I think we've kind of text proven it scripturally, that the temple will be rebuilt. So ultimately that conflict between that one little piece of land of all the earth, this one little piece of land, is going to be challenged in the most profound way. And I believe Israel will win out over it and they will build that temple. And then ultimately we find out that after all everything is done, after the tribulation, after the rapture, after the Antichrist is dealt with, you're going to find out that Jesus is coming back to the earth or beyond the earth to rule for a thousand years. He's going to rule and reigns with his saints. That's you, and me, and everybody else that has followed Jesus throughout the course of life. We'll rule and reign with him for a thousand years on the Temple Mount. What a great and glorious day. But interestingly enough, guess where he's going to rule from? It's not going to be New York City. It's not going to be Moscow or Paris or Washington, D.C. Out of all the places, there's going to be on that little place in Jerusalem, where you see that little temple built. That's where he chooses to rule and reign. It is his bait, his house, the house of the Lord. So in summary, the main events of the last seven years start really with the Antichrist confirming 
a covenant with many. He's going to do that, try to make a peace treaty. Covenant with many. After three and a half years, the Antichrist will stop the sacrifice and the offering in the temple and declare that he is God. And this proclamation, and by this proclamation, the Antichrist will likely uh, create a huge rebellion amongst Israel and the Jews and the rest of the world, really. Some will accept him. And those who do not worship the Antichrist, who do not accept him, will be severely persecuted in that time. So we're talking about the marks of the beast where you cannot buy or sell unless you have the mark. There's going to be a time when the, those who oppose the Antichrist will be severely persecuted. The Bible actually uh, refers to this time as the Great Tribulation or the time of Jacob's troubles, which are absolutely synonymous. But you know, Jace, Jacob is really uh, a, another word for Israel. Jacob is Israel. Israel is Jacob. And there's going to be a choice that has to be made. And I will tell you that um, if I were you, I would make the choice to follow heart and soul 100% with the Jewish Messiah, who is Jesus of Nazareth. Very critical, very important. And I want to, I want to end with this final thought. There's, there's so much information uh, to share on the third temple being built and the ashes of the red heifer and the, how, the, how the, the priesthood and the Sanhedrin, which is actually in existence in Israel today as I speak to you. It's actually a Sanhedrin there. They are actually preparing for the temple service and for the sacrifices therein. It's going to be a phenomenal, phenomenal thing to see. But I want you to just remember what we taught the other day. If you are a born-again Christian, God has not destined you for wrath. Now, in this world, you have tribulation. But remember, tribulation and wrath are two different things. The wrath of God, nobody is going to be able to stand about. You can't, it's just over, overwhelming and overpowering. Tribulation, we can get through. We'll get through tribulation through our faith and our perseverance in the Lord. You get through things. But the wrath of God will be the most incredible force that the earth has ever seen before. So these things all happen in the context of the end times. And here is your final thought for today. It comes out of the mouth of Jesus in Luke chapter 21, verse 28, one of my favorite scriptures. He says, But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is is drawing nigh it's drawing near your redemption is drawing near so when you see these things begin to take place this lawlessness abounding and all this crazy stuff straighten up that means don't bend over don't make your head look at the things on the earth pick up your head look at the things that are above straighten up lift up your head because the time is near it's very near that the lord is going to bless and gloriously save the, his church, those who have not fallen in the apostasy. So keep that in mind and think about that when next time a person asks you, well, what do you think about the third temple? You think there's going to be one? Well, you might be able to answer a little bit more clearly now. All right, let's pray together real quickly and um, we'll join together next week. Uh, don't forget to support the church. Uh, we really appreciate those of you who are uh, sending your tithes and offerings in and you're helping us uh, to get through this very difficult time uh, that we're all going through. God bless you on that. Uh, stay faithful. And um, we also want to mention that we have a prayer wall that we have at, at, at Cornerstone Church. Uh, David and Janie uh, uh, Baird run this um, 
uh, prayer wall for us, and they do such a fantastic job at, uh, at uh, monitoring and keeping uh, together all the prayers that we get requested from all different areas. So if you have a prayer request, send it to us here on this um, Facebook cast that we're doing, and we will make sure that it gets on the prayer wall where our best and chief intercessors will pray for your needs as well, okay? So let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the, the privilege of knowing that we are not left on this earth in a whirlwind of lawlessness, but the day has been planned and it is coming, O oh Lord, that you will lift up your church from this earth. And Lord, that we will forevermore be with you in the kingdom of heaven, where there is extreme joy and peace of which no human being has ever been able to comprehend. A peace that passes human understanding. A place, Lord, where there is greater joy in one moment than an entire lifetime on earth. And we thank you, Lord, that you sent your son to pay the price of our entrance into the kingdom for which we will evermore be thankful. Lord, knowing our condition and how weak and sinful we are, you still decided to have your son sacrificed in order that we might be saved. So today, Lord, we receive Jesus Christ as the son of the living God. And those of you who are out there who, who need to rededicate your life to the Lord, this is the time to say, Jesus, I rededicate my life to you. I believe that you're the Son of God, and that you're going to come again in the resurrection of the living and the dead. So we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless uh, each and every one of you. Joyce says hello. And uh, my son Stephen, who has done a wonderful job of putting the temple in the background here. It feels like I'm sitting there. Um, and we will get an opportunity to talk and pray with you next week as well. So God bless and see you soon.